All right, so the goal today is to answer one of the um, main questions that we ask in this class, namely, what return should I expect from a risky investment project? Now, you remember from week one that the easiest way to do this is to go out in the market and look for similar investments as the one I'm considering. And then under the idea that all discount rates are opportunity costs, I'm going to tell myself, well, an investment project like this in the market earns a certain return. So that's the return that I should require from this particular investment project as well. So sometimes we're very lucky. Sometimes we find exactly what we're looking for, like we did on day one in this class, in the refinancing example, we had uh, an instrument that was traded that was exactly like the cash flow whose present value we were trying to calculate. But most of the time, it doesn't happen that way. Most of the time, um, I don't have exactly what I'm looking for. So in that case, one thing that you can do is you can appeal to fundamental or theoretical finance. So what fundamental finance gives us are asset pricing models. And asset pricing models tell us, given the characteristics of those cash flows, this is the return that you should expect. So this is what we're going to build today. We're going to talk about the two main models used in uh, practice, uh, two main asset pricing models used in practice to decide how much return I should require from a particular project. And those two models are CAPM and then factor models that are just CAPM plus other factors. So they are also known as factor models. So the first step today is to uh, understand where CAPM is coming from. So this discussion here is going to be a bit of a loose and wordy discussion of CAPM, but in my notes, in chapter two, you have a full-blown uh, formal proof of CAPM. So you can complement what we're doing here by reading those notes. Okay, so asset pricing models also go to the market and they do ask, uh, you know, cash flows of a particular type, what do they earn? So let's go to the market. So this is what we did here on um, Tuesday. We were looking at a particular example of an economy with three possible asset classes and we built this feasible set, which is basically all the risk and return combinations that we can build. And so we remember that we're looking at an, at an investor who, of course, is looking for more expected return. But on the other hand, she dislikes risk and specifically she dislikes variance. So this is the world of classical finance. The world of classical finance is one where investors only care about two things, expected return and variance. And in addition, they don't like variance. So on this chart here, what it means is they're trying to move to the northwest. They're trying to go in a northwest direction. They're trying to generate more expected return and less risk. So they want to move to the left and up as much as necessary. So the first thing, and we already said that on Tuesday that this is going to mean, is that a lot of those portfolios here are dominated. So uh, a lot of those dots, uh, no investor would look at them. So for instance, the dots that are in the center of this graph, because uh, there are portfolios that either have more expected return holding risk the same or less risk holding expected return the same or even better, they have more expected return and less risk. So we do not want to consider those dominated portfolio. And as we said on Tuesday, once we eliminate those dominated portfolios, what we are left with are um, uh, what is what we call the efficient set. So the red line here is just the northwest boundary of my feasible set. These are the only portfolios that an investors that an investor in classical finance is going to be willing to consider. Everything else is um, dominated. Okay, so if our investor here could only invest in risky assets, she would look at uh, whatever she likes the best on this red line. But in classical finance, what we do is we also assume that there is another portfolio that is available. And that portfolio is the risk-free portfolio. So it's that gray dot that you see here. So the risk-free portfolio is a risk-free asset. So let's think of it as a treasury say it has zero risk. I know exactly what I'm going to get. So it's all the way to the left, but it gives me some return. And so the vertical height of uh, this dot here is just going to be the risk-free 
return. So here, here we go. Our investor now has more choices. She can put all her money in the risk-free asset or she can put all her money in one of those risky portfolios on the red line. Or, of course, she could combine those portfolios. And when she combines those portfolios, by which I mean put some money in the risk-free asset and some money in the risk um, uh, in the risky portfolios, she's going to get combinations of those risks and returns. But when she combines those portfolios, she's not going to get any diversification. And she's not going to get any diversification uh, because as we discussed on Tuesday, when you mix two assets, one of which is not risky, you only get an averaging of the risk. You do not get anything beyond that. You do not get any diversification. So that means that when you combine um, the risk-free portfolio with dots on, with portfolios on the red line, you're going to get red lines such as the um, green line that you see here. Uh, uh, and here, this green line happens to be very important because it is the farthest I can possibly move to the Northwest by combining my risk-free portfolio and a uh, portfolio on the red line. There is nothing I could do using those combinations of risk-free asset and efficient risky portfolios to go any farther to the Northwest. So this is what we call the efficient set. So we had an efficient set before, the red one, which was the efficient set that you get when you only have risky asset. But now that we have a risk-free asset, we get an efficient set, which is a red line, and is, um, uh, which is, pardon me, the green line, and which is a straight line. That's what I meant um, uh, to say. And it is the, the line, as I said, that is the highest I can possibly get as I go to the Northwest. Now, as I try to push this, uh, to, to push towards the Northwest, I reach a dot, which is that uh, dot that you see here called market portfolio, which is the uh, um, uh, otherwise known as a tangency portfolio. Again, as I try to push my green line as far as I can to the Northwest, this is the last portfolio that I'm um, touching, and it is called the market for portfolio, and this is going to play a very important role in um, everything that I'm going to do. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the green line. So to the left, between those green dots, it's kind of obvious what's going on here. What I'm doing is I'm just combining the risk-free portfolio and the market portfolio. So for instance, the risk-free portfolio itself puts 0% of my wealth in the, risk -free, uh, in the market portfolio and 100% of my wealth in the risk-free portfolio. Conversely, the market portfolio puts 0% of my wealth in the um, risk-free portfolio and 100% of my wealth in the market portfolio. And in between those two dots, I get the risk and returns that I would get, for instance, by putting 50% of my wealth in the risk-free portfolio and 50% of my wealth in the market portfolio. But the question then is, how do I get to the right of the market portfolio? What is that um, green line, the rest of the green line that I get as I move to the right of the market portfolio? So this is what happens when I put more than 100% of my wealth in the market portfolio. And how possibly can I um, put more than 100% of my wealth in the market portfolio. It is by borrowing and by borrowing specifically at the risk-free rate. So this is one of the other key assumptions of classical portfolio theory. We assume that investors have the ability not just to invest in the risk-free asset, but that they can also borrow at the risk-free asset. And that gives you the rest of the green line that shoots uh, to infinity over there. Okay, good. So now we have the efficient sets that we would get with a risk-free asset. So now all we have to ask our investors is basically what is your tolerance for risk? How much risk are you willing to tolerate? So if you took Finance 320, you may remember at this point drawing indifference curves. So indifference curves basically tell you, they ask the investor, are you willing to take on more risk? And if so, when you take on more risk, how much of a compensation do you require in terms of, uh, of expected return? So in different curves that are very steep, suggest that this is somebody who's very risk averse. So yes, they are willing to take on more risk, but you will have to give them much more expected return to compensate them. Conversely, in different curves that are very flat, are investors where they are willing to take on more risk and they only require a little compensation in terms of expected return to do this. So people that have steep indifference curves, they're going to tend to be closer to the safe portfolio. That's going to be their choice. And people that are 
uh, uh, less risk averse, they're going to have flatter indifference curves, they're going to find themselves over there to the right. And these are people who may even consider borrowing at the risk free asset so that they can put even more than 100% of their wealth in the uh, market portfolio. Okay. All right. So, like I said, this is loose. In chapter two, we have full proofs and descript formal descriptions of um, what I'm talking about here. But this should be enough to get uh, to the most important results that we need from classical portfolio theory. Result number one, it is called the two portfolio theorem. So what this is saying, and let me go back to the graph, what this is saying is that every investor in an economy like this, in an economy in which people only care about expected return and variance, every investor is doing essentially the same. They are splitting their wealth between just two portfolios, the risk-free portfolio and the market portfolio. That's it. Everybody's doing the same. So, of course, this is an enormous uh, prediction of the theory, and we know in practice that is not the case. So, obviously, this is something that later we've tried to relax um, in finance. But nevertheless, what this tells us is it speaks to the importance of the market portfolio. So, here in this theoretical world, the market portfolio is everything. Everybody, uh, when they invest in risky asset, all they do is they invest in the, um, in, the, in the market portfolio. So, that's the two-portfolio theorem. And the two-portfolio theorem helps me a great deal towards answering the question I started asking today, which is what return should I expect from a risky investment? Well, a risky investment is going to be a part of the market portfolio. So when I take on a risky project, yes, it's going to add to my risk, but it is going to add to my risk in a very specific way. It's going to add to my risk by adding to the market portfolio uh, that I am that I am holding in the end like everybody in this economy. So all I have to ask myself is, how much risk is this particular type of investment adding to the market portfolio? Now on Tuesday, we learned that when I combine two portfolios, this new project that I'm thinking about and the market portfolio, the resulting variance is basically only a function of the covariance of my asset with itself, but also with the market portfolio. So this uh, now I've narrowed the question of how much risk am I taking on, additional risk am I taking on by taking on this project? It boils down to how much risk am I adding to the market portfolio? And this is going to give us the uh, most important asset pricing model that we have in finance because it's the one that is the most used in practice. And the uh, uh, this most important asset pricing model is called the capital asset pricing model. So what it says, is the following. Just like anywhere in finance, when you take on a project, you're going to require by way of return the risk-free rate, so the rate that you would get from a risk-free investment, plus a risk premium. So that is true no matter what. We don't need assumptions for that. This is a tautology. Expected return has got to be risk-free rate plus a premium that compensates you for your risk. But CAPM is very precise about the premium that you're going to get. The premium is going to be a function of two things and two things only. In bracket is the excess return on the market portfolio. So if you think of the market portfolio, say as the S&P 500, this is how much you expect to get from the S&P 500 during your holding period compared to the risk-free asset. So that has a name, this is called the market price of risk. So this is the excess return vis-a-vis -vis a risk-free investment on, say, the S&P 500. Okay, so that's element number one of the risk premium, and element number two is beta. And what is beta? So as um, um, I said a moment ago, the risk inherent to the project is how much um, the that particular project is adding to the riskiness of the market portfolio. So not surprisingly, the key part of beta is the covariance between the asset uh, you're about to invest in and the market portfolio. But it turns out to be normalized by the variance of uh, the market portfolio. So in some sense, compared to the current variance of the market portfolio, how much risk am I going to add, which depends on how much the asset I'm looking at co-varies with the market portfolio. So that's it. 
if I believe CAPM, and in practice, uh, a lot of people use CAPM, uh, whether or not uh, they believe it. If I'm asking myself, what return should I require from an asset? I just need to ask myself the following question. One, what risk-free return do I expect during my holding period? So basically, what would a treasury earn uh, during my holding period? So that's going to give me my RF here, my risk-free rate. Two, what is the beta? So that's the covariance of my investment project with um, vis -a -vis, uh, with, with respect to the market portfolio. And three, what is the market price of risk? In other words, what do I expect to get from the market? And that's it. So I just have to estimate the beta of my asset, estimate the market price of risk during my um, holding period, estimate the risk-free rate, and then I'm done. CAPM tells me how to put those things together using the equation that you see here. And that tells me my expected return. So that leaves at least two questions. First, uh, I do have to forecast the market return. and um, uh, honestly, that's not easy. Asking, you know, for instance, asking yourself, what do I expect to get from the S&P 500 over the next six months? You can imagine that's a complex question, but there is nothing we can do about that question. That question has to be answered. If I cannot even do this, then certainly I cannot do something harder, which is asking about the return I should expect from a specific investment project. So there's no way around it and um, uh, it will have to be done. Uh, anyway, the other key question is how do I get the uh, beta of a particular investment project? And here to see this, uh, he here to get at this, all you have to recognize is that in addition to giving us this formula, CAPM is also a statistical statement. And the statistical statement is very simple. It says that um, if you're trying to forecast the return on a particular asset, all you need to know is the return on the market and how your investment is going to vary from uh, uh, is going to co-vary with the market. Put another way, um, if you're trying to forecast, say, the return you're going to get from an equity position in a particular corporation, and I'm using here IBM as an example, what it is saying, CAPM, is that in expected terms, the, the, so on average, the return you should expect is in uh, the return you should expect in excess of the risk-free rate is just beta times the market price of risk. Now, of course, in life, we don't get to do expectations. We do not get to invest in a project a million times over. I'm only going to invest once. So CAPM is a statement that is going to be true on average. So that means that when I replace expectations by actual uh, return, I'm going to have a little noise term over here. So that's a little epsilon. But really, so this is what I get after moving the risk-free rate, which is on the right-hand side of the CAPM equation to the left-hand side. I, say the, I, I get that the return on my asset net of the risk-free rate is just going to be equal to a term that's the other term that we have uh, on the right-hand side of CAPM, beta times the return on the market minus the risk-free rate plus some noise. And you can see that already this is looking like a regression. So what I'm doing in addition is to make it look fully like a linear regression. I'm adding an intercept, which I am calling alpha. This is the proper name of that intercept. We'll talk about that on Tuesday next week. This is what in finance people call alpha. When investment, invest, investment managers tell you I'm generating alpha, this is what they mean. They mean the intercept in this regression. Again, we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more uh, on Tuesday. So I'm putting it here. Um, uh, but the bottom line is that CAPM is telling you if you are trying to forecast the return on an asset, the best and only thing you should do under the assumptions of CAPM is run a regression. Which regression? Exactly the regression that you see here. A regression of historical data on uh, the returns on your investment project or investment projects like it. So a regression of, of the um, return on the project on the return on the market. That's it. And if CAPM is correct, I should not be able to get a better forecast, a more accurate forecast than by using this uh, regression. It, uh, th there is no way I should be able to improve on this regression. Now, of course, what finance has discovered since uh, CAPM was brought to life in the 60s is that that claim that this is the best statistical model we can possibly use is actually wrong. And CAPM has failed in many 
many, many different ways. But one way in which CAPM has failed is that uh, we have found, found that it is not just the market portfolio that is helpful for forecasting the return on uh, a particular uh, investment. For instance, uh, a particular equity investment in a corporation. There are other portfolios out there that are also useful. And so here, for instance, I'm showing two. They are the most famous ones. So those, those are the size portfolios and um, uh, value portfolios. So a size portfolio compared to S&P 500 is a portfolio that puts more emphasis on small corporations. So it's a, it's a, it just happens to be a different portfolio. The value portfolio is uh, compared to S&P 500, a portfolio that happens to put more values on so-called high book to market corporations. So these are corporations whose book value of equity divided by the market value of equity is high relative to um, uh, other corporations. The point is, these are portfolios other than the market portfolio. If CAPM was right, they should be used regression. When I'm trying to forecast the return on, say, uh, an investment in IBM, including those portfolios in the regression should um, uh, should not uh, help the regression. The regression should tell me, you know what, this is useless. You're giving me those X variables. I don't want them. They are not significant, uh, a word we're going to use in the rest of um, this presentation. Um, this morning, I don't want them, drop them out, only the market is useful. That's what CAPM says. Well, in practice, that is not uh, what we find. As I said, um, size and value have been found to be useful for forecasting returns. And by now, we've discovered another 60, 70 portfolios, maybe 80, I don't remember how many, it grows all the time, that are also useful. Things like momentum, things like the reversal portfolio, and so on. Um, and so forth. So CAPM fails in that sense. The other sense in which CAPM fails is the alpha terms uh, in those regressions here. According to CAPM, uh, there should be no alpha, by which I mean in this regression, the intercept should be zero. Because an intercept that is, say, a positive intercept, what that means is that you are able to somehow to generate return above and beyond what CAPM is predicting. Well, that can't happen. If CAPM is correct, there is nothing else. The only returns you get are returns associated with beta. There is no additional return that you, um, uh, that you get beyond the beta uh, on, the, uh, on the market. So that's it. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to take those two regressions. This is regression number one. This is just the CAPM regression. This is the regression that is supposed to be best and unbeatable for forecasting the return that I should expect from a particular project. So we're going to do this regression, and then we're going to do this regression, which is called the Fama French uh, regression, because it's named after the two economists who first discovered that uh, value and, um, uh, and size were also useful for forecasting return. So we're going to estimate both. And then we're going to ask, is CAPM surviving or is CAPM failing? And remember, if CAPM is right, the coefficients on those additional portfolios should be zero, basically, because the regression should tell us, I don't want them. So I don't want to use those portfolios to forecast my return. And alpha should be zero. And so this is what we're going to do next using, um, this is, uh, using data that um, we're going to start downloading now.